What's up, guys? Good morning. Um, just going to wait for a couple more people to get in here. We'll get started. You guys hear me okay? Nice. JP in the house. Where's everyone from? UK, Ohio, Tampa, Italy, London, Holland, Thailand, France, Denver, Russia, Ireland. Wow, pretty cool. Philippines, Malaysia, New Mexico. Tango Baker in the house too, what's up man? Cool, so everyone can hear me, that's good. All right, one sec, and we're gonna get started. So a bunch of people ask questions via email, I'm gonna to try to get to those first. Um, and then we'll open up for like Q&A here shortly. Probably gonna run about two hours today or so. We'll see how long it takes to get through everyone's questions. Uh, last week, we weren't really able to. Um, one second here. We're gonna give it about three more minutes before we really get started. Just let people kind of pile in quickly. That way I won't have to repeat myself. What's everyone trading today, if you're trading? Sitting on hand, no setups, BLNK, VTVT short, nice. Yep, VTVT. Bot stocks, BLNK. Yeah, so I mean, just looking at everyone's answers, there's just not too much to trade right now. I'm personally not really watching anything, to be honest. Um, I've, I don't know, I just don't see too much. We do have VTVT is pretty much the top percent gaining right now, it's up about 36%. Um, looks like a gap in crap to me as of now. Recent supernova, tons of tons, tons, tons of volume on this day right here. Let me uh, let me get the chart for you guys quickly. Sorry. Boom. There's the chart, and pull the chat up. See my screen now. Cool, cool, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Good. Um, so VTVT, we had a gap up this morning. I don't know if there was any news. I don't see any news. Um, let's see. Oh, there was, they're going to be delivering two presentations, um, at the 11, the clinical trials on Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, that's generally not a long for me. Um, Let's see, when are they going to be? They are going to be Wednesday, October 24th. That's when they are presenting. Um, through Saturday, October 27th. Okay. So they're delivering two presentations at uh, some clinical trials on Alzheimer's disease conference. 
Yeah. So, I mean, for me, that's not a catalyst I play. I don't ever play, I don't ever play catalysts where they're, where they're going to be presenting something. Um, now, have I seen stocks run due to that in the past? Yeah. I mean, they will run in anticipation at times. Um, in this case, it's next week. So any pop is more than likely a short for me generally. When I see this catalyst, it's just not a catalyst I like or ever play long day one. Uh, that being said, you know, this is a very volatile stock. Um, it went parabolic back beginning of October, followed by a pull, you know, it tried to uh, kind of push again. And it's tried several times. Interesting, the only really interesting thing to me about this chart is that it's held up so decently. Um, you know, this wasn't your two and done all the way back down kind of deal. Um, so any, any possible swing short, people who are thinking they're just going to swing this all the way back down, you know, have the possibility of getting squeezed. I think that's maybe what you were seeing here and kind of throughout this period. Um, but it's held up decently. Kind of funny timing on this PR, but but that's the only thing. I mean, this thing does have the capability of breaking out, I believe. But this day, on day two of the run, just so much volume there. Really ugly candle. Tons of bag holders. This chart's still decently fresh. You know, maybe another couple weeks or a couple months, and once this thing kind of faded out, it may be different. But but it's still a pretty fresh chart. I could see the squeezing. Depends on what the news is going to be next week. Um, problem is you never know, you know. I think generally when they're, when they're delivering, you know, presentations at a conference, they may or may not even have new information. You know, that's, and that's, my, that, that's one of the issues I have with this catalyst at this time with this chart. Uh, we'll still have fresh bag holders, decently fresh bag holders. Uh, still, you know, going to be quite a bit of resistance all the way up through till six. So we'll see how this reacts. It may grind up, you know, meanwhile's kind of an anticipation, but, but, uh, generally when it comes to, you know, generally when it comes to biotechs for me, I mean, it's just risky. I, I never, ever, ever buy an anticipation of any results. I just don't do it. Yeah, sure. It can work out sometimes. Other times, definitely not. You know, it's totally, it's totally hit or miss and it's a gamble. And while in a sense trading can be like gambling in that, you know, we're putting money down and then it's out of our hands uh, to a certain extent, you can still control where you're taking your gambles and if they're calculated or not. In this case, it's a complete gamble either way. I mean, they could come out tomorrow and say that, you know, that someone had a, you know, very poor reaction. They have to cancel their trials and stock gaps down 50% overnight and you're stuck. So I'm really careful with, uh, I'm really careful with biotechs and this catalyst in particular, I don't play long day one, so I don't really care. But it'll be on the watch for next week. Uh, kind of into those presentations, kind of have an idea of what's going on big picture wise in case the news does come out. Yes, this is being recorded. Um, yeah, so the last one was recorded. This one's being recorded. And both of them will be to everyone uh, via email by Friday. You'll have, you'll have uh, sign up links to replay them. One second. One more. Okay. Okay, we'll get to questions in a second. Anyway, so just to update update you guys, yeah. Uh the, these two 
will be have been recorded. This one's being recorded. They will be sent to you uh, by Friday via email with links to sign up. And what else? DVD. So I'm getting the final edit back today. I'm going to be able to watch it all the way through, which I'll be doing today and tomorrow. Um, and then I'm hoping that we'll be able to release this next week, which would be awesome. Um, but I have a firm date of October 30th. That'll be, you know, the last day where that, that's where it'll definitely be released by October 30th. So giving myself like 13 days in case, you know, something I see I don't like. But, but uh, best case scenario, you know, as soon as possible, October 30th deadline. Hope that works for everyone. I know uh, it's been a couple months here, but thanks for being patient. Just wanted it to be really good. Didn't want to just kind of put it out there. Um, let's see, November webinar. There's still uh, November boot camp in Phoenix. There's still like 20 or 15 rooms left on the room block. So for those of you who are planning on coming and just haven't booked yet or whatever else it is, um, or if you don't have the link to sign up for the rooms, let me know. Uh, I'll actually post a link to it in the chat quickly. But if you haven't, you're planning on coming, you want to stay at the resort, it is very nice. It's a really good rate. I think it's like $300 off the you know nightly rate. Um, definitely get your room block rooms before they're out, which should be pretty soon here. Uh, quickly... Let me grab that link. I'll post it in the chat. Um, one second. Boom, got it. Okay. So I just posted the room block link in the chat for you guys. If you haven't booked your rooms, there it is. And uh, yeah, quickly we'll get we'll get back to this. Lorenzo asks, "Can we talk about bootcamp info, hotel, and stuff?" Yeah, let me let's get into that quickly. Um, let's see here. Um. Okay. So, um, yeah, so boot camp, uh, it's November eighteenth and nineteenth, which is next month um about a month from now exactly it's going to be a sunday monday so it's a little funky but we're doing sunday monday so sunday um we're starting at 9 a.m that's arizona time and sunday is going to be a day of basically just lecture um going through lessons kind of uh getting ready for for monday um Obviously, you don't have to have watched the DVD by then, but I think it will help, you know, if you've watched the DVD by then, um, because we're going to get into a lot of the stuff that's, you know, is also in the DVD, just in a little, you know, different kind of format. So it would definitely, definitely help um, if you have watched the DVD by then. Um, and I think you'll find it a good watch, you know, there are, there are some that are more difficult to watch than others. I think it, it flows nicely. It'll be uh, keep your attention well, put it that way. So November 18th and 19th, starting at 9 a.m. on the Sunday. Um, on the Saturday, if you guys want to come in early, I will be golfing. Um, I'm thinking about getting a block of times, and maybe we can even do like a small tournament or something or uh, something like that, maybe a little scramble. So whoever's interested in that, if you are, I have to kind of jump on that with the golf course um, at the resort. But let me know. I can check that out. 
and possibly, you know, we'll get a little block in tea times for Saturday and then, you know, have a lunch or something like that. So if you're interested in that, just uh, either DM me on Twitter or email me. And you can email me at roland at rwtrades.com. And I'll look into that. Um, anyways, if not that, we'll be starting at 9 a.m. On, on, on Sunday. Then we'll go to about 4 p.m. We'll have a lunch break. We'll have a couple breaks, you know, just for everyone to stretch their legs and whatnot. And then on the Monday, we're doing live trading all day. Uh, live trading, you know, we'll mix in lessons and Q and a. So, so that will be starting basically at 6, 15, 6, 6, 15 AM on Monday. Um, for those of you from the East coast, I apologize in advance, uh, but welcome to my world <laughs> and everyone on the West coast this is what we do over here. Um, you know, my days generally start at like four thirty, five 5 AM and and I just got used to that. I love trading. You know, I wake up, I wake up uh, excited and passionate almost every morning, even with three kids and, you know, getting a cut, you know, I mean, we, I get a couple hours of sleep at a time. There's always one kid who's got something going on at night. So, so we'll be uh, starting at, I know I'm kind of rambling, but we'll be starting very, very early on Monday morning, uh, live trading and some lessons throughout that day. Um, you know, fingers crossed we have a nice good day in the markets and it's not too boring like today. Today is very boring in my opinion, which is fine. Yesterday was also very boring. I've been forcing trades for the last week and a half in a major way. I'm actually on one of my worst losing streaks for a while. I think I've lost five of my six last trades or something like that, which is annoying. Um, but it totally happens. Like, I don't know. I found, I found this year, especially not so much. I've been pretty accurate and I, and part of that's cause I've just been so patient. You know, I've traded maybe half the trades this year that I did last year. And you know, a big portion of that is just the markets, how they've been. So, but, uh, yeah, so we'll be do doing Q and a, um, I may have a guest speaker or two. We'll see. I'm still deciding. Um, I'm chatting with a couple people and seeing if they, you know, if that's something they want to do. Um, yeah, live trading, some golf on Saturday. If you guys want in, we'll have, we'll, we'll, we'll be having a little reception on uh, Saturday night, just kind of a meet and greet. If you're there staying there Saturday night and and that's about it, guys. There'll be breakfast uh, before the market opens on, on Monday. So, yeah, pretty straightforward. Pretty straightforward. Uh, the venue's Ke the Weston Kierlin Resort and Spa. Um, you, should, you guys should have RSVPs for this. Um, if you don't, just let me know. Just let me know. And sorry, sorry to everyone. If you've, if you guys, if anyone's DM me on like Instagram or Twitter and even emails to a certain extent, I'm so behind. Like, I mean, I'm so behind. I'm trying to get to everyone's questions. I may have to hire someone to do this because I, you know, trading full time and then trying to handle all the customer service can be really difficult. Probably going to have to do that. Um, but I'll get to, I'll get to everyone's questions today. Yeah, so we'll be at the Westin. Um, it's really nice there. It's they have an awesome pool. The golf course is amazing. Uh, the rooms are nice. Restaurants are good. It's also right across the street from uh, from one of the nicer shopping centers in in Scottsdale. It's like great food and and the weather will be spectacular in November. So I'm really looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to meeting a lot of you. I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of you again. I know I probably met many of you at uh, Tim's conference, you know, just the other week back in October or back at the end of September. Um, so that's that DVD. We've got October 30th as October 30th deadline for release. Um, 
boot camp link has been posted in the chat. If you still need the link later and you're not in this webinar currently, um, if you're watching the replay and you need that link, you can go ahead and uh, DM or email me. Um, I find email to be the best way to get a hold of me. And generally, I'll try to answer those as much as I can. Uh, I just get too many DMs like on Twitter and Instagram from random people asking random things. Uh, so that would be the best way if you need to get a hold of me. Um, let's get to some more questions. And let me just do a quick check on my scans and see what's going on. Um, Okay, um, will the AZ uh, boot camp be recorded and available to everyone? Yes, it is going to be recorded. Um, I'm not 100% sure. <clears throat> I was going to try to stream it, but we may not be able to. Um, but yeah, for those who can't make it, we will be recording it. And that should be available to everyone shortly afterwards. So live stream, not 100%. We may try to do that. Um, and we may do that. We'll see. Um, itineraries will be emailed to everyone and posted on the site. That will be, um, we're still working with the catering manager. So the, the, uh, the itineraries will be out pretty much within the next two weeks or so. It'll be out by the, by the time the DVD is out. Info on the private group I discussed. Yeah, so I, I mean, lot, most of you know I have a kind of a pilot test group that I've been running for a little while now. Um, and I mentioned it during the last webinar, we may be opening up like 10 more seats, but we're keeping it really small for the year, for the whole of 2018, basically. Um, 2019, we may roll out a couple more seats. Um, Yeah, so I mean, you're free. You feel free to email me on that too if you're interested in that. Um, we can do a uh, waiting list for that, and it'll be kind of just first come, first serve. So go ahead and email if, email me if you'd like. Like I said, it's a small group. We have a really small chat. I just do a couple webinars a week, and we're just testing things out. They're kind of like my test bunnies, and they're cool with it, and they understand what it is, and it's been pretty cool so far but we're officially starting that in November. Greg asked uh, Sunday for the boot camp, 9 a.m. for sure. Is it possible to start one hour later? It'll be nine or 10. Uh, initially it was 10. We may do 10 for people who are you know, getting in town that morning. DVDs October 30th as a deadline, but maybe earlier. Who can't be recorded? Yes, we discussed that. West side's the best side. I totally agree with that one. West coast all day long. Just love it over here. Plus really you get to be done trading at one, you know, that's the best part of it. Oh, Yeko's making a little move here. Hit my radar, just kind of uh, don't like trading this ticker. <laughs> Such a dog. But it's ran in the past. Does have news. I'm just going to leave it be. The current climate, like, you know, we haven't seen anything going too crazy. And generally, you know, when we don't have too many runners, I really take off the gas pedal especially right now, like with the things that are going on, I've been trading very 
thinly for now. I haven't been placing as many trades as normal. Um, we haven't had too many runners. You know, everything's been kind of getting stuffed for a couple weeks. And this year in general has been much slower. So, so I am le much less likely to chase or, you know, take any real size on anything um, until something changes. You know, when things start going, I don't have to catch the first runner. You know, say this thing went to 10, I missed it, and then it ignites a flurry of maybe low float Chinese stock runners. I don't have to play the first one. You know, I generally will miss the first one. Not all the time, but most times, you know, when things are slow, we get some kind of big runner, I'll miss that first one and then start nailing some of the other ones. Maybe usually the second one I'll miss as well. You know, I want to see confirmation that, okay, people are stupidly buying low floats right now and it's a little bit safer. Um, you know, find, find one with a catalyst and hit it day two or day three. So for me, you know, I'm not really going to be aggressive until I see that. This looks halted. It's halted. Um, so I'll leave that alone and you guys can watch it when it halts. Um, Julio asked, can we meet around 5 a.m. on Monday so we can see what you're going through news, et cetera? Yeah, I'll be like, I'll be there probably starting at 5.30 and doing my process, getting ready, you know, the last hour of the day, getting ready uh, the hour before. And anyone who wants to come earlier than mentioned, I will be in there. So feel free to. Did I post a link for the discounted hotel rooms here? I did. Uh, you should, it should if you scroll up, you should see it, but I just posted it again for you. My email is roland at rwtrades.com. How long is the DVD? Uh, it's 13 hours as of now, and then there's another two hours that I'm debating whether or not to put in. I'll know that, you know, by today or tomorrow. Thoughts on BLNK? Yeah, no real thoughts on it. I mean, I saw this pop yesterday. Now it's sitting down here. I don't care about it. It was a one and done, it looks like, for me. You know? I mean, this thing, the initial move, I believe, was due to uh, Amazon, some news with Amazon or rumors or something like that. Um, I believe. I'm not 100% sure. Um but I do remember this move. I actually made decent money to the upside on BLNK. So I remember this thing, you know, vividly. It's just such an ugly chart. And I do believe they were diluting into this. The float, you know, was made even bigger. Um, it did some good squeezing before that happened, but it's been straight fade ever since then. Um, you know, a couple days here and there, a couple odd days here and there. This was actually a really big move to the upside for this stock, you know, based on the situation. And their PR yesterday was that they're working with Google and Google with Google Maps. Um, and they're going to be basically, basically you'll be able to search for, you know, EV charging stations and, and they'll come up on the map. You know, they're going to make sure that all their addresses and info are on the map. So not, you know, not a big deal. And I was joking around with some, uh, some of my guys the other day about this, you know. Like, oh, I listed Wolf Trades on Google Maps and, you know, I'm, I'm working with them now. So it's, uh, it's kind of a funny, it's, you know, very fluffy PR. It worked though, you know, and, and generally when it comes to Catalyst, when someone actually has a deal or is working with, you know, a company like, like Google Maps or whatever, um, I'd be bullish on it, but not news like that. That's pretty fluffy. You know, it's not like they're, and, and it may, and don't get me wrong, it may drive more business to their charging stations. You know, that's certainly a possibility, but I don't really care, you know? Like you had a, you had a very small time frame in which to buy this yesterday and make, you know, good profits. I mean, it still had a decent move, especially in a close. I underestimated it completely. When it got stuffed at 350, I was like, oh, she's dead. 
Um, this whole thing, you know, I believe I thought she was dead, but it held the lows, you know, from the unhalt. Um, and had a nice close. But then you get this after hours gap down and you're stuck. And that's why you got to be careful. I mean, it like on the surface, okay, they had news. Uh, it's a first green day and it's closing their ties. Like it's a decent overnight pattern. But I mean, especially lately, most over, we haven't seen many D day two moves. I don't know, other than the weed sector, like if you can think about it, just very, very small amount of two day moves right now. Um, we're not seeing things squeeze for multiple days outside of the weed sector. And so I've been really, really careful with my overnights. I haven't really been taking them for, you know, quite a while. I mean, I don't remember the last overnight I really took because I've seen too many of these things do this, especially recently, you know, close near their highs. They have a catalyst day one, whatever gap down and, and fade. So that's something I'm keep. I'm always keeping in mind is, you know, what patterns are working and what aren't. And right now overnights have not been working great. So I've been much more careful with them. Um, the other thing they've been doing is, you know, gapping down and then having another push for some reason back towards red green. Um, and it's been really choppy. Everything's been so choppy lately. Now, is that because of short chat rooms now? You know, we've got like MIC and ducks and some different short chat rooms. I don't know. I think it has something to do with it. I think, I think the short side has, is becoming more and more crowded. Um, I think, and you know, I've spoken to several people now who have kind of mentioned the same thing. Um, borrows are getting more competitive. And so I spoke about it last week. I really believe, you know, there are going to be a lot of these moves and maybe day two moves that don't go on. They get kind of crushed. Um, but I, on the other hand, when things get going, I think we're going to see some really, really crazy squeezes. So I'm just waiting to see how this thing's going to pan out. But, you know, we've got several short bias chat rooms now where it used to only be long bias chat rooms um, or pumpers or whatever. And we're seeing kind of the other side of this token now. So I think, I think it'll, you know, it, it's going to have a big effect. I think there's more liquidity. There's more people trading these things um, maybe due to Tim or whoever, you know, the people who are really attracting traders. Um, so I think it's very, very interesting times we're in right now. Uh, plus we've had the overall markets doing their thing recently. Um, had this kind of correction over the last week and you know, and that's given me a little bit of pause to the long side as well and everything I'm doing, you know, um, looks like it's stabilized a little bit here at least, <clears throat> at least, but But when we have, you know, times like this, at times, you know, the penny stock, the penny stock market and, you know, micro cap is kind of a bubble. Like we, you know, at times I've seen penny stocks ripping and ripping during, you know, for example, this last pool back here um, on the spy back in, you know, February, March. <clears throat> I mean, we had some penny stocks ripping during that period of time. So it's not necessarily, I don't put all my weight into it, but when I take this into consideration and then see there haven't been too many real runners, especially with listed stocks, um, you know, every, when I'm saying, when I'm talking about the markets, I'm talking about listed stocks in terms of small cap for the most part, not OTCs. Um, but the OTCs do their thing too. You know, sometimes they're in play. Uh, I feel like lately the best plays have been OTC plays, but but sometimes those aren't in play either and you can't find an OTC for months. So, so the overall market definitely, you know, I take it into consideration, but that being said, I mean, this could keep going down and we may start seeing runners in the penny stock world. So I, that's, I just have to gauge that correctly and then play accordingly. <clears throat> like I've taken two losses now on AGRX and trying to go long and it's the charts telling you otherwise the charts telling you like no it's not getting in this gap right now you know and i was just kind of a little bit uh i was playing it this day and i was playing it this day and you know and then i bailed so i you know when stocks fail to decisively break out you have to be careful and that was the case here several times AGRX, what else did I trade? 
I forget what else I've traded, but yeah, I've been, you know, last week I had like several midday trades and an after hours trade, none of which worked out. Um, so I've pulled back in a major way. Here's Yeko. Low float on Yeko. So this thing can do whatever, whatever it wants. I'm not going to take a piece just to do it. What platform do I use? This is Street Smart Edge for Schwab. Um, it's the, what I use for my longs for the most part. I like the charting. Um, I have a center point account that I have not used yet, but I'm going to get into that as soon as this DVD's out. Um, as soon as the DVD's out, I'm getting back to just like full-time trading again, so that will be good. Uh, that being said, it's been this year's been kind of a good time to do what I've been doing because it's been so slow in terms of the plays I like. Um, I still have an IB account. I have DAS at IB. I like that. I still have equity feed for my scans and news. I still love that. It's one of my favorites. I still have stocks to trade. Um, I use it from time to time. Um, I'm just so used to equity feed at this point. Uh, what laptop do I use? I have an MSI and I also recently got a Razer Blade Pro or whatever. I don't know. I like it. I like Razer's stuff. I just like how it looks. But both of those are pretty high powered gaming laptops. I can do whatever I want with either of them pretty much and be fine in terms of running software and multiple, you know, uh, internet windows, whatever I need. So while I'm not playing the Echo right now, I'm watching it. And I, you know, I'm glad that this thing ran hundred percent. I'm waiting, I'm waiting to see runners come back and then I'll get much more aggressive. Put it this way. If I were watching this chart, okay. And I knew low floats had been already running. And when I pulled the chart up earlier, you guys, I think you guys saw it was probably in the two twenties or so. Yeah. I would have considered buying it right there. Period. Like as a momentum play, low float has news day one. Um, I know it's ran in the past and I wouldn't, I may not have been in it by now. I may have taken it all off by now. I play them really safe. You know, I get a, I get a rip like that. I generally will take off most and then let some run if I can, but this is a chart I would have played. You know, I could have risked basically a buck 80 grabbed maybe 5,000 shares, five to 10,000 shares here in the low twos, twos and twos and had really set risk and then if the chart actually ran through high day at 250 then you get this move um with the ramping volume kind of thing so only reason i'm not playing this is because like i said this hasn't been in play so i haven't been playing it but i like to watch and i hope this thing can go absolutely nut bars and if this thing really starts to run i'll have my eyes out on like you know some of the other chinese stocks what are they CCIH, I think, when I played in the past. Yeah, this thing's ran in the past with Chinese stocks. Cali's a Chinese stock. I think they have other stuff going on, though. Yeah, that's super ugly. Uh, Cone, K-O-N-E. There's another one. This thing's ran in the past. They do these little weird one-day moves, all these, all these plays. Um obviously doing nothing right now, but, but that's kind of the, you know, the, what I'll do when I see a Chinese stock like Yeko run. And that's one of the cool things about, you know, getting trading experience. You know, people say they're, they've been studying for three years. I'm like, what have you been doing then? You know, I mean, it's good to study, but you, you need to trade. Like you need to get trade experience. And the, you know, the, the tickers you trade and you see go parabolic and then you see get slammed. You, I mean, you build a little memory bank in your head. So when, so in terms of sympathy plays, people are always kind of talking about how do you find sympathy plays? For me, a lot of it's just been playing these things over and over again. So I know when shippers get going, I can rattle off a handful of shipper stock tickers that may run in sympathy. Um, when weed stocks get going now, there's like a million weed stocks. So it's a little bit different. Um, when I first started trading, like the first time I saw weed stocks, there was like, you know, a handful of OTC weed stocks. Uh, same with Bitcoin stocks. Like when Bitcoin was running, 
uh, the first time that I was playing Bitcoin stocks, they were, it was like a handful of OTC Bitcoin stocks. And as they get more and more trending, you start getting some listed companies um, who try to take advantage of it. And then, you know, it changes. So in Bitcoin's example, it used to be like GBTC, BTSC, BTCS. Um, there's a few others, BITCF. And, and then, you know, as it got more and more popular, next thing you know, you had like 10 listed, you know, quote unquote, Bitcoin stocks uh, trading on NASDAQ, uh, DPW. Um, DPW, Mara, M-A-R-A. Riot, you know, all these, I mean, it's, it's crazy, but that's what happens. And, and that just comes with experience. So it's kind of a cool thing. So if Yeko were to get really get going, I'll have my eye on some Chinese stocks. I don't think that's the case. And if it does, it's usually a one or two day move. So I, it's something where I'd be able to scalp pretty decent gains from any kind of move like this if it happened. So I kind of got off on a tangent there, but that's where my head is. Any idea why BLNK News Catalyst didn't do more Google Maps team up? I think it's, I kind of explained it earlier. You know, it's pretty fluffy news. Like, oh, so they're going to put you on Google Maps where you could add yourself to Google Maps if you wanted. You know what I mean? And there's a little more to it. Like they're actually working with Google to have, you know, accurate for, and I'm sure it's possible, uh, you know, they may pop up on the map if, if you're like electric vehicles close to it or I don't know, who knows how it's going to work, but it may, it may end up helping the company, but in terms of a catalyst, I don't like it. If that makes sense. It's not like, it's not like Google's paying them a billion dollars, you know, and they're going to work together kind of thing. required for pilot program just email me man just email me I haven't gotten too many emails about it so it's good Whole Foods that's right thanks dude Trayvon um, BLNK the last run was Whole Foods it was not what I said which was Amazon it's been a little while when was this back in May yeah, this was from Whole Foods putting them, you know, their charging stations in Whole Foods, which is obviously a much better catalyst than, you know, them, they're going to be added to Google Maps. Like the fact that Whole Foods actually put this. So, and it was only a couple stations. I was actually, I played like the initial move. I didn't really play it beyond that because I was very bearish at that point. You know, I thought it popped a lot. And it was just put, they put their charging station in a couple Whole Foods. It's not like, you know, a miracle thing. So that's what that was about. It was a Whole Foods, Whole Foods news. So, I mean, you look at a daily chart on Yeko, for example, and it's just so ugly. Like it's popped in the past before, no doubt about it. Um, you know, and it's popped big in the past, but it's always a one and done. So it's something that I'm just super careful with. I don't know what all this is, but yeah, it's not something I'm playing. It's holding up really nicely, really, really nice move. And it bodes well. I mean, it's 150%. Coming out real quick. Give me a chart. Zero volume. <clears throat> okay.
Pete asks, when I was under PDT, did I ever hold, did I ever hold overnight without day trades available? So I had to, I had to hold to avoid 90 day restriction. Yes. More times than I want to admit, um, particularly when I only had three trades there. And uh, not too many times. I did it a couple times when, and that, uh, before I realized that I can't do that. Okay. During your last day trade, I would not hold overnight. If you're in a, if you're in a situation where you're going to handcuff yourself for three months because you have one day trade left, you shouldn't be doing that. That's completely, completely irresponsible. I think. I mean, what happens when you're on your last day trade and, uh, and they do an offering after hours? You have to be prepared for that situation. You have to. You have to be able to cut it. If not, I mean, what are you doing? You know, you're, you're risking possibly taking your small account and cutting it in half. Can't afford to do that with a small account. So, good question completely under your power. I wouldn't do that. Um, if you have issues and you need more day trades, you need to figure out a way to get more day trades, be it opening another brokerage account and then you have to wire between them. Um, most of you probably heard this one already, but at E-Trade, I had nine day trades. I had an account for me, an account for my wife and a joint account. They're all linked. I was able to transfer freely between them and get nine day trades there. Um, that was my workaround. And it was one of the benefits of being married. <laughs> so definitely irresponsible to be holding. And I've done it. You know, I was there. Um, but that's an irresponsible thing. And it's completely under your control. So much in trading is not under your control. So much of it is not under your control. That the things that are under your control, you need to be in control of. And, that and that's why I think cutting losses quickly is so important. That's something you get to control for the most part, you know, bar very, you know, rare circumstances where you get caught up. For the most part, it's completely under your control. Um, and that's one of the things I preach the most. You know, one of, everything that's under your control, you need to work on being in control of that stuff. You know, once, I mean, once you're in a play, you don't, you don't control what the stock's going to do. You just control your own actions. And that's the whole entire game of trading is control over yourself. That's why discipline's so important. That's why patience is so important. These are things that, these are your own personal psychological issues that you're battling, but that you ultimately have control over. You know, you're in control over your computer. You're in control over your entries and exits. You're in control over your risk reward. You're in control of all of that. But if you don't know what you're supposed to be controlling, then, you know, then you're wandering around randomly, not controlling anything. I promise you that's one thing you, you can control. You shouldn't be using your last day trade on an overnight. It's too risky. Even if it's a perfect setup, you know, the perfect most high odds setups still don't work at times. And if you're going to handcuff yourself, that's one of the worst things you can do under PDT. In my opinion, is use that last day trade and screw your account for 90 days. It's a long ass time. And I did that. I've done that. I've had a 90 day restriction on my account before, you know? So I know what it's like. And I had to open up a different brokerage account and let that account sit there for 90 days. It's messed up. So good question. And very, very important, I think, my answer. My thoughts on the dip buy on VTVT? Yeah, I'm ignoring VTVT. I mean, I don't care about it. Seemed to bounce right off after hours, little breakout yesterday. Do I now put weight into after hours pre-market due to lack of volume? Yeah, I put almost zero weight into after hours pre-market. Sometimes I like buying, like say, um, you get some kind of consolidation and grind up and it kind of tops out pre-market, then pulls and rips through that high. Sometimes I like playing those. But, you know, generally I wanted to see that it did quite a bit of volume, you know, like serious volume after hours or pre-market. Other than that, I put very, very, very little weight into pre-market highs and lows.
Alex asked when I'm looking to dip by, how do I gauge what my ideal entry dollar or percentage amount is at? Realize it's not an exact science, which it's not. Um, just wondering what you think about when looking at these types of trades. So it depends. There are different kinds of dip buys. You know what I mean? Very different kinds of dip buys. Am I looking to, is it a, and that's why these questions are so hard because there are so many different scenarios like dip buying. Like I said, there are just too many scenarios. There's an OTC panic like CVSI. Um, and when I'm playing like an OTC panic, like on this day here, where we got this massive panic, um, amazing, one of the best I've ever seen, you know, down to 350 there. When I'm playing a panic like this on an OTC, like say, uh, let me see, let me get this. Boom, boom, grinding up, grinding up. Red day like this, okay? So this is what I was looking at this day. Massive panic and it hit nine bucks. And for those of you who remember playing this panic and I actually have a video lesson out on it, you know, it was just slaughterhouse on the minute charts. Uh, it had already cracked nine and Citron tweeted at like, I don't know, the stock was like 860 or something like that, I forget. But they tweeted shortly after their little hit piece and then Tank City. Um, on a stock like this, yeah, I was looking at basically like 450. I was looking at the whole and half dollar marks to see how they, it reacted, but the main thing I was watching was level two. So, you know, level two turns, level two turns are generally, you know, when I'm playing an OTC panic, I'm looking at level two almost exclusively. That's how I caught this one was level two. Um, generally on OTC panics, I'm looking to play morning panics, uh, not so much afternoon panics, sometimes midday panics. Um, so there's one. When it comes to OTC panics, I'm looking at level two. When it comes to um, listed panics, it, they're, you know, totally, there's just different scenarios. I mean, say stock had a good catalyst, good day one, and then maybe spikes and pools the next morning, and I'm looking for a dip buy back to maybe the previous day's high to hold, um, or maybe green red, something like that. Um, if it's day one and it's, and you get a spiker out the gate and then pulls, I'm kind of looking to buy maybe the first pullback on a dip buy. Um, if I've waited, you know, 30 minutes, I may be looking at dip for a dip buy back down to a trend line, you know, so, and maybe have some, some different area that I'm risking off of. So it, it really depends. Um, but generally, like what I'm looking for in a dip buy is also what I'm looking for in, you know, my first day plays, like something with a catalyst and the markets are good for this. You know, that kind of, I'm keeping that stuff in mind. And then I'm just trying to find good risk reward. So maybe there is a level of consolidation from the day before that was really strong or a high that was really strong that then became support later in the afternoon, you know, and I can kind of use a level like that into the next day if a, if a stock pulls back. So... So it depends. Uh, another scenario, say it's day one, stock rips and then pulls, and now we get have a big first crack um, and maybe retraces 30% or 50%. I'm looking at kind of those areas. Uh, once it breaks down below 50%, generally I, it's an ignore for me and the chart's dead. So, you know, a, a, when a stock moves, it should not go all the way back from where it came from if it's a strong move, if that makes sense. So I hope I answered that question for you, but I get into that in the DVD for sure. Generally, I'm always dip buying, guys. Generally, I'm always dip buying. So it may not be dip buying panics or anything like that, but even for entries on a chart, like I am not buying strength. I'm not buying this high day break here. I'm not buying this break here. I'm not, I rarely buy new highs. Why do I want to buy new highs? I don't. They, stocks pull back. I can get a better entry. That's how I feel. Um, that's how, and that's, that's one of the ways I keep from getting FOMO to the long side is I know this stock has to pull back. Maybe I'm not going to get a perfect entry. And at times, like maybe on the, you know, the chart this morning, um, you're not going to get another entry. And if that's the case, then that's okay. If I'm not buying the first, second or third pullback, something like that for the most part, unless it's into the afternoon, you know, I'm not buying new highs. And I'm definitely not buying new highs going into lunchtime. We still have about an hour, but 
I'm not buying this period. I'm just trying to give you uh, an idea. David, the schedule for the camp that you, you'll be getting an itinerary in the next couple of weeks, but we'll be starting either at 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. on Sunday and at basically 6 a.m. on Monday, and it'll end Monday after market close. We'll decompress maybe for about 30 minutes to an hour, just kind of like meet and greet talk. Uh, but we'll be done by at the latest 2 p.m. on Monday, the 19th. Paolo asked, with the crowded short scene, do I agree this can lead to more frequent and larger squeezes? Yes. I think, well, I, let's say not necessarily more frequent, but I think when the squeezes happen, they will be very large. Yes. But I think there are also, a lot of moves are going to get crushed and not recover. Okay, so many questions. Holy crap, we're definitely not going to get all of them. Okay. Do I think the patterns in general will change as more players come in long or short? Yes, they, I think they're already changing. And I've heard Gratani mention it. I've heard. Um, Ducks mentioned that the patterns are morphing, and I already think they are as well. I already think they are as well. So with um, – so, and that's why, like, with my DVD, I teach strategy. Like, I teach, you know, in terms of dip buying and all my strategies that I use, even how I play breakouts and stuff, I do teach that. But my emphasis is not necessarily on the strategies themselves because the strategies are always going to have to keep changing, and you have to keep adapting. And that's – and that's one of the most important things that I try to get through to people is that everyone's looking for a pattern. Even, and I'm guilty of that. I used to look for patterns and I wanted to know what the best patterns to play are, but now I've played them so many times, I realize, guess what? They're not always in play. Like, yeah, I know them. And when certain patterns are in play, I'm able to capitalize. So it's great to know. But it's a matter of everything else you're doing to be able to, to change with the patterns. You know, you have to be able to adapt and you can't do that if you're, su and you're stuck in like just a pattern mind frame. You know, you have to have more of a macro perspective on what's going on and, and why. You know, I mean, you have to understand what's going on in the space. So for me, most of what I'm trying to convey is like getting a process that enables you to adapt and that enables you to continue to be profitable no matter what's happening. So... Um, do I play red green setups? I, I, you know, I do at times, but not too often. You know, I'm never, uh, I rarely just play a red green setup. Um, if anything, like for me, so like if it's a day, so red green setup means that a stock on day two has gapped down or, you know, gone green red and then it's come approaching red green. So green, red, red, green, it is an important level. Um, but I'd much prefer if a stock opens weak and maybe flushes out to like a level of support from the previous day or maybe the previous day's high, which may not sometimes, but isn't always like green, red, red, green. Um, I'd much rather be buying a dip to some sort of level of support. Um, a lot of times once you get back to green, red, you're looking at reshorts. You know, that's a big time reshort for a lot of people. So... You know, when I'm playing that, I'm always trying to get a better entry. You know, so I'm not more than, than green, red moves. I'm looking at dip by a day two to support or previous day's high. That, that type of thing. Um, that way, 
say I do get a move, I can actually take off into green red and into red green and lock in some profits. And then if I do get that red green break and then it does start to spike into day two, then I still can have shares, but it's just a safer way for me to play it. So I can still have shares. My average will be lower than uh, red green. And if red green gets stuffed or, you know, reshorted and gets stuffed, then I can take off the rest of my trade and still be safe. So I hope that answers that question. Um, say if I was in Yekka, where would be my exit point? That, you know, that's so hypothetical. I hate giving answers like that. Um, but I, if, had I bought it, I would have definitely taken off some into this parabolic and probably the rest into this high day break or, or even this break in here. I like selling strength, so I'm generally selling green candles. But yeah, it's hypothetical. Best advice trying to grow, grow a small account. I'll keep saying it over and over again, cut losses quickly. That's the only way to grow a small account. Now, yes, commissions will hit you. So, I mean, you got to take your loss and maybe your $10 in commissions in and out. But $10 in commissions in and out is much better than $200 loss on a $2,000 account or, you know, a $500 loss on a $2,000 account because you didn't cut quickly. So, and, and, I, and I go into this in the DVD. I have a whole section on PDT. Um, but a big part of that, the psychology behind not wanting to cut your loss because you're using a day trade is, is total is a completely real thing, but it's also one of those elements that's under your control and you have to get over it. You know, PDT sucks. I disagree with PDT. That being said, it can also, you know, if you can get the hang of it while under PDT, you know, it can be a blessing because you're not over trading. Um, so cut losses quickly. And then you, and then really what you have to do is find, you know, through trial and error, what patterns work best for you, um, find a couple different strategies that work best for you. And when that is in play, exploit it for all it's worth. Um, that's the only thing I can say. You know, I have a couple guys I work with who just like smash OTCs. You know, they're really, really good. They found a niche with OTC trading and certain OTC setups that work for them more often than not. And they've been able to grow their accounts really, really well because of that, because they found a couple plays in, you know, in one market that worked out for them. They're not trying to trade everything. They're not trying to take it overnight every single night just for the hell of it, which I used to do. You know, when I was under PDT, there was a period of time where I took an overnight almost every night because I wanted to trade. Um, I got over that eventually. I realized it was too hit or miss. Like right now, there aren't great overnights. So people are looking for overnights and then getting gap downs and screwing their accounts because of that. So it's not always an overnight. Overnights are not always in play. Um, but, you know, it's, it really will come down to finding the patterns that work for you and then exploiting them when you can. And then a lot of patience, man. A lot of patience. A lot of cutting losses quickly, getting risk reward under control, being very, very patient and picky. Very patient and picky. Those are all some of the keys. Okay. How do I find swing plays? I'm not, you know, I generally am not, I mean, I'm looking for swings, but I'm not. Um, generally what I do is I'm looking for my day one move. If I get in nice and early, hopefully I can take some shares into day two. Um, so it depends. There are some setups I've seen as swings. Um, you know, like the weed sector, for example, there have been some decent swings there, um, which I didn't capitalize on correctly, but that's okay. Uh, Eric said, I know you've mentioned avoid, I avoid trading the first 15 minutes, but say I'm in an overnight stock that closed strong on the previous day. Next day, I'm risking off either green, red, or late day consolidation level. How do I gauge a morning dip the next morning as time to stop or stop out or fake out? It just depends, man. It depends on the situation entirely. You know, if my risk is intact and that was my plan to hang on to it, even to, through a morning dip, um, then that's, then that was my plan and I'll try to stick to that. So it, to, it totally depends. 
The only time you have to be careful is if you're overnight, you don't have a risk level that you're using and you don't know what you're doing. That's when you get caught holding bags and doing dumb things. You always have to have a risk level. And if your risk gets hit, freaking take the trade off, you know? That's my policy. Unless it's like a bigger float and I know it's not, the floor is not going to fall out on me and I can hold a couple more cents. And that's my plan. This was short 30K VTVT on open, I believe. Doesn't surprise me. Really doesn't surprise me. I mean, on with that news and just like this chart in general, like I said, I was not I would not go long in this. No matter what it does for now. But it's holding up decently. It's not the end of the world. Still under VWAP. Do I go over dip buys like that in detail in the DVD? Yes. Am I recording this webinar? Yes. Sorry, one second. Do I market order on my dip pies? Most of the time, no. I mean, it, generally when I'm dip buying, I you know, have an, I, um, an entry in mind and I'm not, so I'm not trying to buy dead bottom, in other words. Sometimes I do, but I'm not, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm just looking for some kind of bottom confirmation for me, um, which, which could be as simple as like volume, uh, some green volume coming in at a level of support, like an important level. Do I use level two on Street Smart? I don't use their level two because it sucks. I mean, I haven't purchased packages on there. I use DAS's level two. So yes, this webinar is being recorded. Um, Even asked how you know that overnight holds are not working too well right now, but what is my ideal criteria for a stock overnight? Um, Pretty much any of my videos you can see that but it's very it's very simple catalyst first green day for the most part sometimes second day um catalyst first green day i want to see that it did good volume i want to see that if i go through the filings there's nothing crazy in there warrants uh, etc i don't want to see too much overhead resistance on the daily chart um i want to know that it has range and that it has a history of running for multiple days um you know, that's kind of the gist of it and that the chart's strong, closes its near its highs and that I have somewhere good to risk off of. I mean, that's in a nutshell, that's how simple it was and still continues to be. Um, but, you know, if there's a history of one and dones, you don't want to be taking a chart overnight. You don't want to be taking a ticker overnight for the most part. So daily charts are really important. Intraday charts important. It's all important. It's all important. But catalyst to me is a very, very big thing. Catalyst and volume. What are the catalysts that make me want to buy if I find two identical setups but only had to choose one? What's the deciding factor? Is it the catalyst? Um, yeah, uh, essentially. I mean, if, if it's two charts, identical charts and setups and everything, yeah, the, you know, for me, it's the catalyst. So, like, what catalyst do I like? Biotechs, I like when catalysts have successful phase results. Um, obviously when the floats are a little bit lower, it's better. Um, so I do like that, but I always take that into a grain of salt that there may be a pending offering. If it's a one drug biotech, two drug biotech, whatever it is, they're in development. They have no revenues. It takes a very large amount of cash to get a drug to market, to get through all the testing phases and then get it to market. It takes a large amount of cash. So, and how do biotechs do that? They can either do an offering or they have to you know, do some sort of partnership deal or licensing agreement or something like that with a bigger firm. 
Um, that's really it. So, I mean, more often than not, you see offerings, you know, and it may be, it may not be after day one, but I've seen it, you know, I've seen it in the middle of day one at times, which is ridiculous, but I think it was, uh, IDXG, you know, they were on a massive run and then midday they just dropped a PR that they did an offering. I got caught up in it. I was up big and then I was down a little bit and had to cut. Um, so yeah, so biotechs, I do like that. Um, I love when any of these penny stocks get an actual deal or are working with a comp big company like Amazon or whoever else. Um, it's not very often. And a lot of times you have to be careful because it's just rumors and I don't play rumors for the most part. Um, any catalyst work, a company's getting a large injection of cash, you know, without diluting shares that is, um, you know, some kind of licensing deal or like, you know, some kind of large injection of cash. Um, and I'll look at their market cap, you know, a stock has like a 5 million market cap and then they're getting a $10 million investment from somebody or whatever else it is. Um, it gets my attention. Earnings when earnings are in play. Earnings can be a really great catalyst and multi-day catalyst. Um, but at times earnings do nothing. And then, you know, when, and you'll look through earnings and maybe they look great, but the stock tanks or you think the earnings are terrible and the stock runs. So ultimately price action is what matters the most catalyst aside, you know, but yeah, there, are, I, I have a whole section on catalyst in the DVD as well. So very detailed section. I actually have done some data, data tracking on catalysts, so it, it'll be interesting. Have I watched Dux's DVD? What do I think? I liked it. I, it's really good. Dux is a really, really good trader. Um, and he's a good guy. So, yeah, I liked his DVD. I, fi I find it... I find it obviously it's important to the short side to watch stuff like that. But for the, for longs, funny thing is the second my long changed that like one of the main things that changes once I watch trading tickers by Gratani, like once that was the first time that opened my mind to what a really amazing short seller, how he thinks. Okay. That, that was so important to me because, because that's what, you know, that was the first time I realized, holy crap, my buys are completely wrong. I'm buying in anticipations of breakout of resistance and I always get screwed. Not always, but many times I get screwed. I, when I'm buying high of days, I'm getting screwed. Like there were so many scenarios that he went over as short setups that I was thinking were buy setups. And so that was, you know, mind blowing to me. And, and now whenever I'm trading long or short or whatever it is, mostly long these days, but when I'm trading, I'm thinking, you know, is this a short setup or, you know, and then, and then you can also use that to predict squeezes at certain levels. You know where, you know where the big players are shorting. And you know that if, you know, once they start, if one or a few of them start to kind of get freaked out, you may see the thing pop through high day rather easily. So, and then, you know, go parabolic. So it's, so it's very important to know, but yes, I liked his DVD. On average, how many trades do I make per week? Do I trade every day? I trade every day. I don't place a trade every day, especially times like this when my listed stocks are not running. Um, I'd say on average, I'm trading three to five times a week right now. And granted, I've been working on the DVD and doing a lot of things. Um, so I haven't been able to trade as much as I'd like to. So I, I think I'm under trading a little bit right now, but it's okay. I'm going to step on the gas as soon as you guys get the DVD. So that being said, you know, when people talk about PDT, I, I might, I could be under PDT and do just fine. That's a fact. Like I would still be okay. That's about how much I trade a week right now and all year for the most part. Um, could I please go over the catalyst for biotech criteria again? Yeah, it's just positive phase one, phase two, phase three results. 
Phase two results are better than phase one results. Phase three results are better than phase two results. Generally, after they get through phase three, they are able to bring drug to market if all goes well. So, so you know, phase three is usually the most important. Um, and then they'll give updates, you know, throughout, which I find to be not the best catalyst. Like, you know, whenever they announce that they're going to be presenting or whatever else, it's good to know they're going to be presenting. Um, but it doesn't even have to be anything new. So like for me, I, that's all I'm waiting for. In terms of biotechs, I want positive phase one or phase two or phase three news. And then I take it with a grain of salt. I try to take my piece and get out of there because most of the time there's a pending offering. You know? So biotech catalyst is really simple for me. Obviously, then you have to gauge what is the, you know, what is the medication? Or is it a medication for that costs little amounts of money and has a very small market? Like how many people, you know, is it a very rare disease and there's only 10 people in the last 100 years who have gotten it? Then that will always be less bullish than, than a big problem, you know, like cancer where they're curing, you know, where they have breakthroughs in cancer treatment, stuff like that. Um, you know, big market diseases. So I'll get into that in the DVD as well. But that's the gist of it. What are my thoughts on MMNFF? Yeah, I, another one I missed. I haven't, I haven't really hit the pot stocks well. I just didn't really hit the run up. I think I've just been a little preoccupied. I can tell you this is something that I'm not going to trade. I mean, it may have a little multi-day breakout going on. I just haven't played it. I don't really, I'm not comfortable with it. It's up a lot. The sector's not necessarily doing great today. I'll just leave it alone. Will I up upload this webinar to my YouTube channel or someone else? Yeah, this webinar, the last webinar um, from last week, will, everyone will get a link to, to the site where this will be by Friday. Yes, October 30th, DVD. Kai Gentile's manipulating the echo. It's funny. It's possible. Uh, I think he's going to be, I think he's in a little hot water. I don't think you'll see him doing that. Any hostile takeover soon any hostile takeovers of non takeoverable companies. What's my driver? Like my golf driver? Um, I play an M2. I play an M2. I've thought about getting a uh, jumping in the M3 or M4, but I hit my M2 too well. How do I use SEC filings when going into a trade? Generally, it depends. Um, generally, I use them when I see a gap down and I'm thinking about maybe a gap fell strategy or I see a gap down in general and I want to know what was happening during that gap. Um, and then if I'm holding a stock overnight, particularly if I'm thinking about building a large position, um, I will go through that as well. And I'm just looking for warrants. I'm just looking for any at the market offerings or convertible notes or whatever else, uh, maybe preferred like convertible shares or whatever. I'm just looking for a form of dilution and making sure I'm not in the way of that. Um, I have a whole section on that in the DVD as well. Pretty much everything I'm talking about here, I, there's going to be a section in the DVD for you guys that really gets into detail. And, and just what I have found is important and what isn't. How do I scan through filings efficient, efficiently? Do I use the keywords? Yep, control F on Windows. I'll pull up like the 10Q, control F. Then I'm searching for warrants. I'm searching for, I'll put ATM. 
I'll put at the market, I'll put at dash the dash market. Um, I'll put in convert, convertible, um, and that's essentially it. And then I'll go and look for the 424B4, B3s um, to find like offering prospectuses and see, try to get details, um, try to get accurate share counts, all that stuff. Kawana asks, do I trade pre-market that much? Um, if I see news come out, do I rush and try to get in before everyone else after researching the news and fundamentals of a stock? No. And generally, if it's great news, you're not going to be able to get in before everyone else. I mean, there are people who have algos designed to buy certain news. You know, I mean, there's, it's just one of those games that I did do that for a very long time. And, my, and the results did not justify the effort. There were two, there were two hit or miss. A lot of times if I see news first, you know, before volume actually comes in and it's after hours or pre-market, you're going to have to be buying your shares like 20% higher initially just to get it. And then when volume comes in, it may just tank. So, so I let, you know, you don't have to be the first of the news. And that's something that took me a really long time to really get a hold of. I used to, I mean, for a good portion of 2017, I was behind the computer from 4 a.m. to 5 p.m. and watch every single news article that hit my feet every single one and I played a lot of the good news and I had mixed results and I realized you know what this time that I'm spending doing this is not paying off I know what the good setups are I'll let them come to me you don't have to chase setups you know you really don't the best setups will come to you if you're patient and you'll have those moments where where you know it you get that kind of gut feeling like this is a great setup risk rewards great catalyst is great and then you make your move it's not so much just always looking for news. I, I don't trade the news anymore. But I use the news in my process. You know, I do want to know if there's news and what it is. It's just not a fact that I need to be there first buying it first thing pre-market anymore. I don't do that. What's my go-to resource to find the catalyst? I use equity feed. I use their news feed. And if it's not there and I see something moving, I'll do a quick Google search for news. I'll search for it on Twitter. And you have to take you have to take Twitter and anything you see always with a grain of salt. Any PR even. Like when companies release news, you have to take it with a grain of salt. Always. What's their MO? You know what I mean? Let me see. Um, let's see, someone, uh, let's see, um, let's see, can I name one really good trading book that were a cut above the rest? Oh, uh, the Brett Steenbarger books I really like, um, the psychology of trading is really good, Daily Trading Coach, those are probably my two favorite there. Um, I really like Market Wizards. Um, I think it's Jack Schwager, I'm not 100% sure. But Market Wizards is one of my favorite series. It's, you know, they, he, man, he interviews like hedge fund managers and some really amazing traders. As an example, can I look at EAR's 15 minute chart over the past few days and tell me if it would have been a valid morning panic dip buy into 90 cents range? Sure. I underestimated EARS. I was long EARS on day one of the move or day two that is. I was long on uh, this day and I was long like in the 130s and it would have been a really decent trade. I only had a thousand shares though and I was concentrating on AGRX so it took my attention away. Um, yeah, I, I probably wouldn't have played this chart at all uh, just because, I mean, the breakout's like 85 cents. And so the day I was playing it, I did play it a little bit. 
I had break even on a thousand shares that I didn't get to build my full position because I switched my attention. But yeah, I mean, I, ha I haven't watched it since then. I haven't watched it since then. Um, morning panic dip by into 90 ish. Yeah. And I don't see that it ever got there. I don't see that it ever got there. So I don't know. Tough call. Yeah, this isn't necessarily a dip by chart to me. I mean, it was just already pretty extended when it hit two bucks. This is dead to me. I mean, I'll just leave it alone. So I can't really give an opinion on this one. I, I didn't watch it. So Yeko keeps going. That's good. Okay. Do I ever see myself moving into higher price slash large cap stocks? Yes, eventually. I plan on getting into options as well. I, I do want to diversify my what I'm able to do. You know, I think the principles I trade with will bode well, you know, into other territory later. Um, I think it's just important to be nimble and like, you know, if so, for some reason small cap dies out or whatever and I can't find plays there, yeah, I am going to start trading larger cap stocks eventually. It's just a different ball game and it's not my niche and I'm doing well in my niche. So I'm going to stay in it, but I am going to start expanding my horizons. I think everyone needs to do that. I just don't like the idea of trading with algos and HFTs and whatever else, hedge funds and whoever. I think my edge really lies down here for now. Is there a way to know short data like the short float that's recent? No. Not that I know of. Not accurate, real-time short data. I mean, that'd be a massive advantage. How does an ATM offering dilution affect the way I dip by? Do I look at the volume relative to the per number of shares offered? Yes, I do. Like, I mean, say, say there's say they have an ATM with like a million left on it that they could sell off and it's done, you know, 50 million in dollar volume that day. It's, it's very, it's possible that, that, you know, that dilution will not have as much of an effect as say a, a million dollar dilution on a stock that does a million in a day um, in terms of dollar volume. Or I also look at what percentage of the dilution of the float is it being diluted? You know, is, is the float, is it a million float and they're diluting 100% with a million shares? Um, or is it, you know, 10 million, is it a hundred million float and it's a million shares? Like it's a, it's a different, uh, you know, percentage of dilution. So I look at that too. So could you say I trade the ticker now? <laughs> yeah, I kind of do at times, to be honest. Like I just, I, you know, I've become so much more of a skeptic um, the longer I do this. I just do. I've been taking somewhat less of the moves, which is okay with me, just more consistently. Like my win-loss ratio this year is much better. I've been much more picky. When I buy 5,000 shares, do I scale in or in one block? Depends. It depends if I'm looking to buy 20,000 or 30,000 shares then 5,000 may be my, you know, my nibble size. Um, if I just want 5,000 shares, it also depends. You know, if I, if I think I may not get exactly my risk that I'd like, I may take 2,500 shares or 1,000 shares, not 1,000, but maybe 25, maybe two buys. Generally, the smallest size I'm buying is 2,500 shares. Um... That being said, once I end up with 10, 20,000 shares, I don't, I'm, I don't mind selling it in two to three, four K chunks, you know, 
at times if I have 10K shares, I, ha I get five sells out of it. So it just depends. What's my favorite pattern? I don't really have one, but I'd say probably if, if I had to get, if I had to say my absolute favorite, it would be dip buying OTC panics. But a really, really quality OTC panic comes maybe a couple times a year. So, you know, my favorite pattern is not my most profitable nor my, you know, most traded pattern. It's just the one that I, the odds are the best for me. Um, it's my favorite, you know, time to be able to take a really good chunk on a bounce, but. But um, yeah, I mean, I, it's a question I really don't like because like I said, patterns just come in and out of play so much. So it's so much more than just the patterns, the trading. Michael asked, do I drink coffee? I drink a boatload of coffee, yes. And I'm in Arizona, so during the winter, I drink hot coffee and during the summer, I drink like copious amounts of cold coffee, <laughs> of cold brew. It's not even funny. You know, I have just a big thing of cold brew at my office at all times, basically. Is Pure Morning Panic the kind I like to play? I didn't see the Pure Morning Panic. I think I caught a tiny bit of this to the long side. And no, not really. I like, I like when a stock grinds and grinds or maybe it's a pump and it's really 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 extended now this is extended don't get me wrong but i like it when it gets really extended and you get a massive drop that's what i'm looking for i want a full out panic not like okay some people are selling am i still in the challenge chat or do i have will i have my own how do you join yeah i so i am in the challenge chat. i haven't been there in a while i've just been so busy um i'll be popping back in the challenge chat soon like I don't know, maybe today I'll stop in and I'll probably pop in every day again and say what's up. It's been just been a long time. Um, you can email me if you want. Good question, Brian. When cutting losses, you've seen some of my trades, I'll cut even less than 10 cents risk. I know it's hard to answer this, but if I cut less than 10 cents, would that be really my risk or is that a cut at a break even or just not liking the action? Yeah, generally if my cut's less than 10 cents, that's the reason. Uh, generally if my cut's less than 10 cents, it's because I didn't like the action or I'm cutting break even, 100%. But that's a good question. Um, the other would be if I'm trading, you know, a 20 cent stock, then 10 cents is a 50 cent drop. So, you know, it's all relative to the price of the stock too. Um, but generally I like, you know, I like plays with 10 cent risk. Uh, a lot of my plays that, you know, since I've been going over it, I end up with like, ultimately I want my risk to be about 10 cents when I have full, full size. Um, I have a good account, but I'm not, you know, I'm still trading a very moderate amount of size. And my risk is still very moderate. I don't like taking losses over $1,000, even now. And it's something that I, I need to work on. I need to change um, my attitude a little bit, I think, in terms of, of losses. I just got so used to cutting for small losses. I really hate taking losses. I don't know. And it's protected me. And I'm able to keep growing. I, I, I just, it's so weird. Like, you know, initially when I got into it and Tim said, cut losses quickly, that was like, I lived by that. I really did. And I didn't know what risk really was. So I wasn't, I wasn't playing off risk. I was just playing off like if the trade went against me. And did I miss a lot of pops because of that? And I was getting stopped out? Yeah, totally. But that's when I was learning. So it doesn't matter anyways. Um, there are times where that's still my strategy. When I'm playing momentum, uh, say like Yeko this morning even, I may have cut that if it just went against me. I may not have let it get down to like, you know, the whatever the 280 risk or whatever it was I was speaking of earlier. So, you know, that's especially long guys, you have to be so careful. And that's why you'll see that I, I find, try to find situations where my risk is so limited, um, but it's at a decent level of support. So it should hold, you know, that's, I'm, that's what I'm always looking for.
And that's why I like buying dips. I get to watch them hold levels and then I get to get in at the bottom of the dip. So. Um, Chase said, after seeing Yeko pattern play out, this is something you'd figure to see a recap from me on IG saying I played the bounce of view, happened, sold a dollar above that. Totally. And, and like, and this is totally a legit move today for now. I mean, it's a massive move. I won't touch it, but this bodes well. Like I'm going to be looking for possible sympathy plays and maybe like I do see JMU popping right now, 15%. Let's just check it out. JMU. And this would be a sympathy play. Now it hasn't done massive volume or anything like that, but just the fact that it's t up ticking, I guarantee you it's because of Yeko. I can guarantee that. It's just randomly moving for no reason. I don't think so. Um, am I going to play this? I don't think so. I mean, I'd love to get a trade in during this webinar. I see yin moving. So, uh, so what I do is I, I, you know, I go to my scan and this is as simple as it is. Well, let's look at it quickly. If you guys have a second, hold on. Boom. Market view share. Okay. So this is my broad scan on equity feed. It's just like literally anything moving on any volume. So you have to take this with a grain of salt. Almost every ticker. I've got like 2000 on there. But when I see something like Yeko moving, I just pull this up just to see if I see anything hinting that it's moving. I think APR, no, that's a biotech. Uh, but JMU here, this hit, I know this is a Chinese stock, maybe Japanese. But I've seen it move in sympathy with, with these plays before. Now, I'm not really seeing much else. I think CLWT. Hmm. KBSF here. Chinese stock, um, yin, I'm imagining might be a Chinese stock, Boxel, B-O-X-L, Chinese stock. So it's not that like they're not moving, they're there. And I, and, that, and I guarantee you the reason these are up here at all is because of Yeko. There are people probably already trying to position themselves for these plays when they happen, if they happen. Now I'm not gonna be that early to it, but I think you can kind of see what I'm saying. Like that, like, and it comes with experience. I mean, I've played Chinese stocks so many times. This thing is moving with volume. It's up 200 something percent now. And sure enough, we should probably see, I, you know, some of these, I'd say JMU, um, maybe KBSF is another low flow Chinese stock, Boxel, low flow Chinese stock, CCCL, um, Chinese stock, CCCL, Craig, some of you probably remember Craig, C-R-E-G, low flow Chinese stock. Um, and, th and that's what I use this scan for. I'm not using this to like, find, you know, I just want to see, okay, I know what happens when one Chinese stock runs a lot. Of, oftentimes the rest of them will get pops in. Are they, do they even show up on my scan? And sure enough, they do. Now they've done really low volume at this point. This one's done, you know, 43,000 in volume on KBSF. Uh, CLDC has done half a million dollar volume. Boxel is now at 98,000 in volume. Craig, 125,000 in volume. But that's, that's what I use the scan for. And yeah, you know, uh, so, I, so I have an eye on him now. Maybe we will get a trade. Maybe we won't. I'm not just going to push the issue because, I mean, this could easily die. Then what, if Yeko dies, you know, the rest should follow suit. So here's JMU, just a little bit of, you know, pop there, and I guarantee you that's why. We got Craig, CREG, same kind of little bit of noise there, not, you know, KBSF is a, you know, was a supernova, same kind of deal here. And that's all you're seeing, I think, are people kind of maybe thinking they're gonna position themselves for some big move. Um, Myself included. I just haven't, you know, I'm not pulling the trigger on any of these.
so yeah there's um so that's kind of my take on that you know there's a handful of chinese stocks that could run into the afternoon or even just randomly midday and if they did i would i would possibly scalp them There's good good question, Michael. If there was slippage past my stop, do I cut immediately or wait for a slight push? It depends. Like, and you guys will hear me say this all the time. It depends. If there's slippage past my stop, is it would depend on how far it slipped. Um, if it was a really quick drop, I didn't have time to get out. I would wait probably for a small push to get out. Um, I did that on AGRX last week. And I've done it in the past. So, I, you know, I don't just panic out if for whatever reason I end up in that situation. I do usually try to wait for a push. At times I'll panic out. It totally depends. Whatever it feels to me like I'll get the best price and safest. But you have to be safe, you know. I mean, a panic can keep going further than you would anticipate. Okay. Yes, that's equity feed, Chris. Will I be recording these webinars? Yes. And you'll get links on Friday. Do I still make watch lists the night before, the morning before, both or all the time? Yeah, I make them the night before. Um, I watch, oftentimes when it's slow, it's just in my head. Um, and then, yeah, and then I tweak my plans in the morning if something else comes up. How many screens do I use now compared to when I started? When I started, it was one laptop. Now I have two 43-inch 4K screens. Um, and then I, I, I've been like collecting screens. I have like 10 screens. I just, you don't really need that much, you know? If you have two screens, that's good enough. Um, I just like having a lot of real estate because I do a lot of stuff. Any resources to learn DAS Pro interested in quick executions? Yeah, they go to their YouTube. They have some good uh, video lessons on it, but it's pretty straightforward, that platform. Pretty straightforward. CIFS, CNET, also Chinese stocks that just hit my radar. China Internet, um, CNET has popped in the past. So, yeah, we're seeing a little bit of action here in the Chinese stocks. Very, very small volume, so I'm not, you know, just jumping into any of these. But it's good to be aware that that's, this is how it works. You know, people are always looking for... People are always looking for, um, you know, sympathy plays. This is how I, I, I find them because I know them. I don't have to find them. I know the sympathy plays. At times when, you know, we have some random sector or some kind of random ticker pop off, yeah, I have to look for the sympathy plays or, you know, go through my scans. But, but in, you know, in a situation like this, I know what they are. I'll probably miss them today because I'm going to be very busy. But now you guys know them. Um. What scanners do I use now, or do I stick with Schwab? Use stocks to trade ideas. What my go-to is my go-to is Equity Feed. Bow screens. Yeah, I've seen his setup. It's a lot of monitors. There's a whole lot of monitors, which is cool. I just prefer the look that I have without all the uh, 
you know, without all the screens separated. Basically each screen is like four 24 inch monitors stacked too high, too small or too high and too across. So I recommend Mac mini for trading or gaming computer much better. No, I would, I mean, if it were me personally, yeah, Macs are more secure and stuff, but I prefer windows just because most trading platforms are designed for windows. So if you have a Mac, and there are going to be platforms that you actually have to, uh, they ha I think that they have apps for Apple where you can run Windows on your Apple. And that's kind of what you would have to have for some of them. Can I explain why Sears is going up with bankruptcy news? Yeah, um, it happens. It happens. It's like bankruptcy uh, pop. It's a strategy of sorts. I don't know. I've seen it, you know. Sometimes these things are about to go bankrupt. They're hitting like fresh lows and then you get a pop. I mean, I don't know. I don't really play them. I have in the past. I know it happens, but. Marvin asked about SLS. I've seen this ticker come up several times now during this. Um, yeah, nice breakout today. I won't chase it. Could keep going, just not going to chase it. I don't know what the catalyst is here. I, I've seen it the last couple of days. Range is okay. I'm just not going to play it. Back testing question? No, I don't do any back testing. I've tried it in the past. I've messed around with back testing, and it just hasn't yielded anything useful to me as of now. I'll probably mess with it again in the future. Once in a trade, do I have mental price targets or it's more of a feel thing and a strength getting out? Both. If I see like a really serious level of resistance, I'll take off, you know, portions into it. And the rest of that, it's a feel thing, yes. Taking off into strength. I like to take off into like high day breaks. You know, you get like a 20 cent pop on a high day break or something, I like to take off into that. Um, and it just goes to show like, you know, when I started, I used to buy high day breaks. And now my goal is to, to sell into them. You know, the, the, the liquidity is good. People are buying and you're able to get some good prices out of that. Um, and then, you know, stocks pull and you can try to get the next leg up. Or if it fails, you take the rest off and at least you sold some dead top. So that's, you know, that's my goal. That's how I extend trades. When people talk about my patience, I'm not very patient. You know, I'm severely ADD. Like, I am not the most patient person. I am just, I just try to be systematic in the way I take profits. And a lot of times, like if a stock runs, you know, a buck and I'm in it from the, from wherever the low was, I'm able to take like 50 cents because I'm selling into pops. Like generally that's what I found works for me. And I'm able to, you know, I won't take the whole move. And of course at the end of the move, I could have said, oh, I should have hold all 10 K shares and sold that top, but that's not realistic. I'd rather have 10 K shares take safe profits into each pop and then end up with 50% of that move which is still a great percentage of the move where most, a lot of people are out way too early with all of their shares. I'm able to extend some of my shares longer. Yeah, Shield with the chapter 11, I mean, they have to do some uh, restructuring and some stuff going on. So who knows, people may be seeing it as bullish and that they're gonna be able to turn it around. I never look at bankruptcy as good news. It's terrible news. But we'll see what happens. You never know. Um, and sometimes you'll see news come out with a stock that's in the midst of their chapter 11 that may be deemed as good and the stock pops. I've seen that in the past too. Doran asked, uh, do I track with spreadsheets, seeing which setups I'm good with? Yeah, I do. So what I do now is I go back at the end of each month and look at which setups I was playing, which worked and which didn't, and which habits I've had and which work and which don't, and try to eliminate the things that I'm not doing well. Um, I just do that at the end of each month at this point. Originally, everything was tracked on a spreadsheet, um, and I did the same thing, you know, but it was on a weekly basis. And I was tracking weekly performance, seeing, you know, where I was struggling and what worked for me. And that's one of the most important things, I think. 
I mentioned the possibility of using, utilizing retracements at certain percentages. Do I have any interest in using FIB retracements? Yeah, I actually like FIB retracements. Um, I don't have too much experience with it. Um, but I understand, I know the levels, and generally for me, I, I eyeball it, and I'm able to see if the pullback is too far or not. Um, but who knows, in the future, I may dick around with it. I just don't, I don't know. I like my setup. I don't having, like having too much clutter in my chart in terms of lines. I know the levels, and I know how to play them, and that's generally, you know, so I keep it really simple. Is it possible to be profitable even if you suck at level two? Yeah, it's possible if you're playing the right setups, man. Like level two with listed stocks can get pretty crazy and unpredictable, and there's a lot of posturing, and there's like weird stuff that will happen on level two. Um, I think it's helpful to be able to read tape for sure. Um, man, it, it is just a matter of taking, you know, getting experience over and over and over again, watching scenarios unfold on level two and watching what happens to the chart. And a lot of times I'll be wrong in my interpretation of the level two. So level two is a tool. It's not be all end all. If you can do everything right and you're not great at reading level two, you should still be able to be profitable, you know, and then you just work on the level two game over time. So yeah, just takes time. Did I have a problem with not taking profits on a winner because I wanted to hold it overnight to save an extra day trade for the week? Yeah, all the time, man. That happened to me all the time. Um, and that still happens to me. You know, that ha still happens to me all the time. Like I, I'll still get greedy at times, want to swing overnight and then, you know, and then end up eating into my loss or even having a winner at time or a loser at time. So, so it happens. That being said, for PDT, one of the best things I can say is you have to try to remove yourself from thinking like you're under PDT while you're in a trade at, to the best of your ability. The words PDT in terms of you're under a trade should never be a reason to stay in a trade in and of itself, ever. That being said, if it sets up and you want to take it overnight because you think you can and the setup's good, you may have some of your best gains that way. So it's, it's a double-edged sword. You, gotta, you have to gauge the strength of the setup, the markets, um, your position, risk, everything. You got to take it all into consideration. But good question. What do I find myself trading more of and being more profitable with? OTCs or listed stocks? I can tell you this. If I had just been concentrating on OTCs for the last couple months, uh, my profits would be much bigger. The fact that I've been, I'm, I'm mainly focused on listed stocks, you know, and I have been traditionally, um, has been kind of a detriment because the plays have not been there so much. So it's been a little tougher um, outside of the weed sector, which even the, you know, the listed weed stocks were difficult to play much more difficult than the OTC. So, so I'll say I like to adapt and go wherever the money is, you know, wherever I, there are setups that will be profitable for me. Right now it's been OTCs. I think I find OTCs, especially for smaller accounts and newer traders to, on one hand, it's more dangerous. You know, the liquidity may not be there. Executions are terrible. Like that's tough to deal with. Um, but in terms of overnights, you know, multi-day breakouts, closing near their highs, you generally will get a gap up. And that's, and that's pretty good. With NASDAQ, many times it's hit or miss, you know, especially recently. And they're, you know, I mean, the, at least OTCs don't trade after hours. With NASDAQs, I mean, they can be manipulated easily after hours when the liquidity is not there, you know? Amazing move on Yeko. Completely underestimated it. Do I ever go long on a trade below VWAP for a dip buy? Yeah, all the time. I do. 
I know like Gratani talked about, he doesn't like buying under, under VWAP, but I find myself buying under VWAP many times. I'm a dip buyer. So like, I mean, it's no different than someone shorting well above VWAP. You know what I mean? I, I, don't, I don't mind buying below VWAP if I see a level of support that I like and should hold. That being said, you know, when I'm long a stock, I, my goal, you want it to be over VWAP. You know what I mean? Obviously, that means the price is higher. So my goal on like morning dip buys is to buy. And if it's under VWAP, so be it. And then, you know, get a green, a red, green push, whatever, and get back over it. I don't use VWAP as risk unless where my risk is happens to lie on VWAP. Um, yeah. VWAP's not everything for me. What's my biggest loss? How did I handle it? <laughs> my biggest loss was on DPW last year and I ate about 40 K. Um, I handled it by dip buying, revenge trading, dip buying into close massive size, the biggest size I've ever taken. And I ended up actually being net positive, like 20 K or I, I, I have to go look through the trade, but I was positive. Ended up 5 K up on the trade, something like that. It's been a while. So I handled it immediately by revenge trading and it worked out really well. It bounced, had an amazing bounce in after hours that I got out into. Um, but that was painful. You know, that was the worst. And, and I've actually reacted to that by, I don't dip by panics into the close anymore at all for the most part. Um, and I don't dip by in massive size. Like I, that scared the shit out of me. That scared the shit out of me. I almost, I almost wiped out a quarter or let's see at the time, I forget what size of my account it was at the time, but a large portion of work, you know, in, in, in less than an hour. And that freaked me out. Um, this year, my biggest loss has been, I think, 6K. And, and I pulled back from the trading a little bit after that. But, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, like I said, my risk is not massive. Like, you know, when you have short sellers that are shorting big, the potential risk is massive. You know, I'm not trying to have 30K swings or 50K swings. I'm trying to make a couple grand a day if possible um, and take my little piece long and get out of there. That's what's worked for me. I try to minimize my risk. I have the least risk possible for the maximum possible reward. That's all I'm always looking for. So... So I got really lucky with my biggest ever loss. It turned into a gain. Um, but I could have taken that revenge trade and then got caught in the after hours panic further and been screwed. So I could have almost blown my account up even. Who knows? Two more minutes, guys, and then we're going to wrap this one up. Do I use any technical indicators aside from VWAP? Nope. VWAP's the only technical indicator on my chart. That's it. I have messed with SMAs. Sometimes I'll throw them up uh, or EMAs like on my daily just to see what's going on. But I mean, the indicators like RSI and all that stuff, they're all too late when it comes to trading like low floats for the most part. They're just, you know, hindsight indicators. They're too late. By the time you the signal comes on your chart, that trade's freaking gone, you know. So I, you know, I've messed with MACD crosses and RSI. Um, fibs are okay; it just kind of gives you levels. But I've messed with Heikinashi charts, trying to extend trades. I've done it all, and I find anything that you know when I have too many lines on my chart, it's too easy to justify staying in positions that you shouldn't be in. Why don't I move up my risk when I'm in a play instead of selling strength on big squeezers? Um, I do that as well. So I will move up my risk on all my shares, but I will still lock into strength. It's just the habit I got into and what I'm comfortable doing now. It makes me feel good to sell into pops thinking it may be the last one. And many times it's not, man. And, I, and I'm all out and I could have, and my, 
profits were not as great as they could have been, but that's fine with me. You know, I'd rather be in that position than not being able to take profits at all and, and having crappy entries and chasing. So it's just how I do it. And you may find that you have better results setting a stop as the move goes and letting it run. Um, I like to be a little bit more hands-on and take profits. And the other thing is when a chart's running, it may not set up the best risk levels. So you may move your risk up and then get stopped out and then it rips without you. And for me, it's, you know, I try to extend it as much as possible. Um, so it's, it's really personal preference. That's what I found works for me. Last two questions. What volume minimum should OTC have to consider longing? Is it different with listed? Yes. Um, OTCs, I'm looking for like 300K in dollar volume at least. Um, that's decent volume to get me interested. Um, with listed stocks, I want to see it doing like, you know, at least a million in dollar volume. And depending on the price of the stock more. So, I mean, it just depends. It depends what kind of size I'm looking to take as well. Uh, question two, if I, t if I trade once, take a loss, do I stop looking at the ticker because of the wash sale rule or do I still play it later? Yeah, um, good question as well. Uh, I don't really think about the wash sale rule and I, I'll continue to look to trade a stock if I've taken a loss. Um, maybe I do need to be concerned about it, but I'm not. So like, yeah, I'm just looking for plays. I, the wash sale rule, I, I don't think about too much. <laughs> Now that I have larger account size, do I use a predefined block size for sizing in now? No. Each, each situation is different. Sometimes I take shares in one whole swoop. Sometimes I'm sizing in in like 2,000 share buys. Sometimes I'm sizing in in 5K share buys. Um, so I know what you're saying. But yeah, if I'm buying 10K shares, sometimes it's two, sometimes it's five, sometimes it's three. Like, it's just, it's just where am I risking off of and where do I want my average to be to have my risk intact? That's it. So I don't, I don't, nothing I do for the most part is cookie cutter. Okay. It's all, it's always kind of, you know, hand sculpted, you could say, if we're using that analogy, like I'm not, I don't have one, you know, parameter for one situation and this is exactly what I do. You know, it's, it's, it's all by feel and it's all basic arithmetic to get my average to where I want it to and the size that I want and the risk I want based on the strength of the setup. Would I swing Yeko? Probably not. And if I was in, I would be all the way out by now. Like I said, these are usually one and done moves. Zach always wants a bigger move, but takes it off too quick because he can't scale out and wants to take the money. I get that, man. Um, when you can't scale out, it's tough. And, here, and here's an issue I ran into with that is that I would scale out and then um, I would scale out and then end up what I call double dipping and then giving back profits, you know, um, because you get FOMO. Like, oh, crap, I shouldn't have sold. You get back in and now you're in a loser. So like... So I actually put it on a sticky note, no double dipping. And now, even if I, if I take a loss or a good win, I have a hard time getting back in the stock because I've kind of ingrained that into my process. Whether or not, you know, I miss moves, it's fine. It's just something that didn't work for me. I find my second trade, if I've already profited on my first trade, I'm never going to have as good of an average or be as comfortable. So... Sean asks, what position of, or fraction do I usually take off into each push? Depends. Depends on the speed of the move. Depends on um, where I see this thing possibly running to. Depends on my size, you know? Um, a lot of times if I end up with 10K shares and I get a move that I like and it's nice and volatile, I'll take it off in like 2 to 3K share positions, whatever it is. So I don't have a set percentage. Definitely don't have a set percentage. But like a quarter, yeah, I'll take a quarter off at a time, a fifth even. Depends how patient I'm trying to be, you know? So that's it, guys. We're going to wrap this one up for today. Good questions. A lot of questions, but good questions. If I didn't answer and I missed it, I'm sorry. That sucks. Um, but I, so this one's been recorded. 
Um, pause recording. Yes, good. It's been recorded. The last one was recorded. You guys will all get emails on Friday with instructions to to uh, to rewatch these however many times you'd like. October 30th, DVD. Um, November 18th and 19th, boot camp. Like I said, if you haven't booked your rooms, there's I just checked, there's 15 spots left. Now there's 14. Uh, get your rooms on the room block. It's going to be a lot of fun. If you want to golf on Saturday, if I get enough people that want to golf, email me. I'll get a block together and then get emails out to you guys with, with times, prices, and whatnot, and format. Maybe we'll do a tournament um, and go from there. So aside from that, if you guys have any questions or whatever else, just email me, roland at rwtrades.com. Um, Boom, there's the, I just put the, the link to the hotels in there again. Um, if you have any questions, just please give me, you know, give me a shout on my email. Um, I am a bit behind, just been so many questions and so many DMs, but I will be catching up um, by tomorrow. I'll have everything caught up in terms of email and DMs and whatnot. So yeah, thanks for tuning in guys. Like I said, if you want info on, on my private, uh, you know, on the little pilot that I'm running through 2019, uh, email me as well. And everyone have a good day. Be safe. Possible sympathy plays. I'll keep, keep eyes out. So you guys should do the same, but no Yeko and these Chinese moves are usually one and done. So be safe guys. We'll catch you guys soon. Thanks for all the support and looking forward to get you in the DVD soon. So Take it easy. No problem, guys. <laughs>